uh, Tapku uh, from UT, who's going to talk about uh, some work at the intersection of machine learning and verification. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Um, so, my name is Ufuk Tapku, and uh, I am at the University of Texas, as Paolo said. And um, I will talk about some work mainly done by those two students, Yun Ha and Cyrus, but later on I will show some uh, glimpses of uh, more recent work and I will add a few names to it. And um, about a year ago, we, we, we started asking questions as how uh, this shiny object of uh, pre-trained large language models might be useful for the type of problems that we want to solve uh, in, in our group where we try to solve uh, sequential decision-making problems, and, and this is going to be a brain dump of that. So let's see if this works. Um, thus. So yeah, um, we, we thought that generative language models provide uh, new interfaces between humans and machines, and at this interface, we try to solve sequential decision-making problems and how they would enter, uh, we thought there, there are a couple of ways they, they can enter this process. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, encoding and uh, helping us leverage uh, sources of knowledge that may not be readily available, um, uh, task-relevant knowledge, and we can try to extract that and incorporate that into the design of autonomous systems. And if we can do it in a way that we can uh, maybe we can do it in a way that we can verify after we extracted and incorporated that knowledge into uh, the design of autonomous systems, whether they satisfy critical requirements. Um, and th the outcomes of that may help us actually refine this process. Maybe we can ask smarter questions or more useful questions uh, to a, a language model and might be able to get into a uh, guided uh, refinement loop. And then also in the second half, I'm gonna talk about how we can, we may be able to ground the decisions that are encoded uh, in the objects that we will be extracting uh, uh, by using the multimodality uh, of uh, some of these models, multimodality as in uh, vision and language together. So that's, that's the workflow. And um, we thought that um, the knowledge that we extract from uh, interactions with language models, if we encode them in a way that we can use existing uh, verification tools that could actually provide quite a bit of service. And we decided that we want to encode uh, the knowledge that we will extract in a finite state automaton. And this is just a cartoon of a finite state automaton. Uh, of course, there's a vast range of different types of automaton, um, but the point is that it is a finite state object and it has certain level of expressivity that we can handle in formal verification. And similar objects have been used actually in, in, for many reasons. Uh, not only in formal verification, but also uh, design and synthesis of, of software and hardware. Uh, there are obviously probabilistic versions of these questions and more recently it had been incorporated into uh, reinforcement learning as well to expedite, uh, to expedite the uh, learning process and improve the generalizability. So there is quite a bit of utility for considering finite state automata. Then what are we gonna do with this finite state automata? We, there's going to be a, a flow of uh, verification questions. And again, here is a cartoon description of it. Uh, and there will be a couple of objects that we will be looking into. Uh, a model, a controller, and a specification, the, the a requirements. This is what we want the end product to satisfy. The C is going to be typically what we will be extracting from interactions with a language model. And M, it says an a model, but it is really whatever independently available knowledge that we have. It could be partial knowledge that we have about the world. It could be a few constraints. Whatever is available that we want to factor into this reasoning. And uh, typically, uh, these models will be finite state objects, controller, we will enforce it to be a finite state object, and the specifications, uh, one can consider variants of temporal logic, 
but also they algorithmically they often actually are translated into finite state objects and this entire thing turns into a large graph search problem which I'm not going to get into but the odd right, I don't know what I did come back so the outcome is typically two things either yes um, this controller when implemented on the model that we have in the world that we, we, we might want to operate in satisfies the specifications this is the green check or red is a counterexample and it might give one reason why uh, things may not work okay so next question that we looked into is where do the automata come from for such problems uh, capturing test knowledge is not necessarily straightforward. Uh, there is quite a bit of knowledge out there encoded in user manuals, for example, online instructions, but it is not necessarily algorithmically actionable. And I believe that language models actually provide quite a bit of utility here that we can translate that vast knowledge that had been uh, relatively hard to act on algorithmically. It provides a nice... Uh, an effective way of parsing through that. And, uh, and automata learning classically had been looked into to extract automata-based task knowledge or uh, controllers uh, interactions uh, through interactions with a learner, but it has its own problems. It, it, it doesn't, the algorithms usually do not scale well, and it is definitely labor intensive. And, and we may not even have access to uh, a complete set of information. So the hypothesis is this distilling automata from language models can relax some of the common assumptions that we have been making in design of controllers for autonomous systems, uh, and, and it might uh, facilitate the process for that. So the, the first paper I'm going to give a little bit of a summary is this uh, automaton-based representations of task knowledge from generative language models. And I'm gonna do it by just zooming to this figure in, in its first page, essentially, we try to start with a very terse description of what we expect out of the system. For example, cross the road. Instead of trying to write long specifications, write a high-level sentence like that. And uh, if you send it to, I think at the time it was GPT-3, as you know, we don't need, has anyone checked whether they actually released a new version since this morning? I don't know. Uh, so things evolve really fast. Uh, but here is a step-by-step -step description of what G, uh, the language model uh, gave us for that, um, for that prompt, and then take that and parse into uh, simpler sentence structures uh, that we know if we had them, we would be able to actually relate them to a finite state uh, object, transitions in it, states in it, at atomic propositions in it. Uh, so that is, that is the mapping. So, so let's look at this crossed road example. It gives these three steps. And if you look at it, I, I, I feel like one of the really useful outcomes is you don't have to start with a large set of atomic propositions, but from the outcomes of the language model, you might be able to actually just read out what, what are these features or atomic sentences that might become relevant uh, for the task you have in hand. We can read these uh, output symbols and atomic propositions out of it and then continue from there and step by step, piece by piece, build this a finite state object that's going to act as a controller. And of course, we can actually go and ask uh, different questions. What if this one was with no traffic light? This is how, we, how you might be able to cross the road. If there was a traffic light, what, what you would do differently? So different paths. And then we can go a little bit further and say that, you know what, this is, this is fine, but how about that one step that you told me, look both ways before crossing the road, how am I gonna do that? And then uh, it, 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 it gave these sub-steps and we can refine uh, the controller that we have based on that. So that, that can, and, and again, the output symbols or the atomic propositions, then now you are good going into a higher level of reasoning, more detailed level of reasoning, uh, they, they, they can be extracted as well. Uh, we also noticed that uh, it may actually give uh, if you follow it, you might cross the roads, but it may also give unintuitive behavior, as in that if you strictly try to follow this automaton, uh, you might actually cross the road and then keep going back and forth. So there is some unintuitive behavior in that as well, and I think uh, we, I, I will get to it. We will be able to actually prune such unintuitive behavior uh, through uh, verification as well. 
So once you have that object, the next thing is uh, let's see if in a reasonable world that controller that we had extracted will satisfy specifications that you might have in hand and, uh, or in mind. And this, again, the model is, it doesn't have to be a complete description of what happens in the world. It could be, it could be uh, a partial knowledge. And in that case, obviously, you are not answering whether this controller is necessarily going to work in that world. You are just checking whether the, the controller knowledge that you have extracted is consistent with the independently available knowledge that you might have. In, the, in, this, in this case, yes, but then you, it is easy to also find cases uh, where uh, the uh, verification turns a counterexample witnessing that, you know what, if you, this is your, your view of the world and if this is the controller that you had extracted, no, you will not satisfy the specification. And here is one reason that things might happen in this, in this order and you will get in trouble. And then that motivated the next step of this, uh, of this paper. Uh, if the outcome of uh, the verification is good, then you are done. There is not, not much you can do. There is not much of an information that you can act on in that case. But if it is no, then there is a question of how we can refine it. And we, we thought of two ways. One of them involves the human user, and the other one we, we can actually get into an automated uh, iterations of refinement. I have one slide on each, I believe. So with that controller and the model that you have, if there is a counterexample, uh, it essentially points to where things might not be working and you can ask, let's refine it and let's see whether actually that uh, lower level of reasoning, if we expand one step there, we can implement it or not. Uh, this is the controller I showed you after refinement and then uh, one more step of refinement was actually prune some of the unnecessary uh, uh, transitions here and it actually boiled down to a, um, a simpler object, more complicated than what we had started from, but not necessarily this intermediate one where uh, it was satisfying the specifications, but it also included these uh, unintuitive uh, behavior. So we would be able to prune that. The other, when we include the human, we essentially actually present uh, the counterexample to a human. And I, I thought this actually is a pretty interesting example. In the first step after failure, in the first step, the human goes and says, you know what, let's, let's refine step one and four. It does it, and it still do, I think it still does not satisfy the specification. Now it comes and says, you know what, let's, we will refine now the following steps, but we also want to have this extra requirement that we want to cross the road only if the traffic lights turn green and no other cars are coming. So human is in, in, in incorporating that additional insight and, and then I believe this is going to have a yeah, green check mark. So we, we thought these would be a couple of ways. And then uh, this obviously crossing the road was a ro obvious example. Uh, then we, we tried to look into a couple of other examples. Uh, we thought uh, whether we could get a, a secure multi-party computation protocol out of these interactions. It was possible whether uh, Wi-Fi troubleshooting, I don't know if you deal with Wi-Fi troubleshooting, but this, this, this drives me nuts. So, uh, so uh, it, it was able to, in a couple of iterations, it was able to get one that passed the specifications and cooking an egg, uh, this doesn't drive me nuts, but I am not good at this. So I, I don't know if this, this controller could help me in making better eggs. Uh, anyway, bunch of little examples. So the three steps of this flow, um, I think are covered by what I just discussed here. The next one is this connection to multimodal um, pre-trained models. And the motivation for that piece is, if this is what we extracted from, from uh, out of these three steps I mentioned, when it comes to implementing this controller, we need to verify whether a we are approaching a pedestrian crossing. We need to verify whether there is a car coming, whether the traffic lights are green. The next question is, who's going to tell us these things, right? Just we, we rely on uh, various types of perception, but it looks like uh, the, this uh, interplay between language and uh, vision uh, may actually be pretty useful here as well. So uh, we will try to do that. So how can we use uh, multimodal models to actually give us these perceptual inputs to be able to uh, figure out whether we can take a transition or not? Okay, so this is now going to look into this um, second paper led by Yun Hao. 
Uh, and uh, this is the flow that we discussed, whatever it is, we end up having this automaton, let's say. Now we will, uh, uh, we will either use a separate uh, uh, vision model or, um, or these, these days they actually come in, in, in conjunction in the same package, right? So we will pass now a part of it. We, we, we are trying to decide whether there's traffic light or not. And then an image from the real world, this is Yun Ha uh, went out and started collecting these images using uh, his iPad. And that's going to tell us whether uh, we should take the transition that corresponds to traffic light or no traffic light. This one is now the, uh, the one that is with the traffic light. How is this going to work then? Start, given the controller and you start from the start, you just proceed based on the uh, labels that you get uh, on, based on the images that you collect at that point that might be relevant for the, for the proposition that you are trying to resolve the, uh, uh, the truth value. And just, just go on. And of course, uh, what just, this, this is just one run of it, right? It's not that there's necessarily be this picture corresponding to this transition. It is just, you know how walking around. And of course, these models will make mistakes, right? Uh, for example, here, uh, it thinks that within this box, there is a green light, and obviously there is not, right? And there are these numbers attached to it. There is a little bit uh, intricate uh, uh, description of what these numbers are. They unfortunately do not correspond to a probability value or anything. They don't necessarily spit out uh, a probable distribution over whether these things are correct or not, or any confidence value. And uh, through a little bit of empirically playing with these things, uh, and as a zeroth order cut toward using these numbers to assess uh, whether we should trust the outcome or not, here is a poor man's version of uh, dealing with uncertainty and trying to actively reason about uh, the effects of uh, uh, underlying uncertainty. So instead of acting on these outcomes as false or true, there is red light or green light. In this middle ground, we will actually call things uncertain. And we will, we will see what we do for, about this. And so we, we expand the uh, atomic propositions with this made up uncertain proposition. And we start uh, introducing self transitions in the automaton that we extracted. And it is going to act like this. So when we come to it in, with this number, it falls in this one example, it falls into this uncertain region. So therefore, actually, when it is uncertain, sorry, when it is uncertain, you don't actually proceed, but you have to stay there. And it's going to correspond to, I looked at this image, it says green light, but I'm not confident enough, then what would you do? So we thought maybe just move around a tiny bit from a different angle, take one, of, one more image, and let's see if we can actually uh, improve these outcomes. And then it is, uh, whether it is at the uh, pedestrian crossing at the start time, it is not, then you proceed. Uh, but when it comes to this red light again, you take a self-transition. Uh, you come to this green light. It is confident enough. You can proceed, um, and then so on and so forth. It just it, is, it just continues like that. But whenever uh, it is not confident enough, you take self-transitions. That a lot that gives you a little bit of time to take another image and uh, um, um, improve your reason um, reasoning. And of course, there will be applications in which you can do it, and there will be applications in which you cannot do that. And, um, and then this is, I believe this is actually, if it does it even, it scratches the surface what we need to be doing here. And the talk about uncertainty reasoning uh, before me, uh, it would be uh, interesting to discuss these opportunities. I think there is a, uh, there is a desperate need for uncertainty characterization uh, when uh, working with these models. And it is one more thing. And then, of course, there's, just, if just, there's, there's a robot arm and the student looked into a few other things and try to, to try to solve some problems there as well. There's a robot that's going to come into it and reason about the numbers, sorry, shapes and uh, colors of the blocks and do something uh, until until something happens. Whatever. That, that's that's another example. I want to go to the last piece. Uh, so this is a little bit of a summary what, of what I discussed. The first part is using a language model extract controllers. In the second part, use the um, the interaction between. Uh, language and vision models, and also try to step in for the perception part and uh, take zeroth order step toward active perception to refine the outcomes from multi multimodal models. So, more recently, uh, what we start looking into is how do these pre trained models actually train? Uh, and who knows how they are trained? Uh, 
right? Uh, but the, the, some, some, some of them, uh, but the, what is publicly shared is that this uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback, as in that you generate a couple of options and a human sits down and I like this, I don't like this, etc. And the claim is that that, that actually helps. Um, uh, and one of the claims, I don't know if it's true or not, but OpenAI, in the, f f at least for the earlier versions of these things, literally hired people to sit down and do these things. And uh, given the sizes of these models and the, the amount of data that they probably use, uh, that looks like a uh, waste of labor. Um, or in their case, maybe it wasn't waste of labor. They actually made money out of it. That's, that, that, so... Uh, it looks to me based off flavor, but it may not be for them. So what we asked was that reinforcement learning from human feedback must be pretty uh, inefficient. Can we, again, in the intersection of these models and formal methods, can we do something uh, differently? And we asked this question whether formal methods artifacts uh, may bring in uh, additional feedback into this process and whether we can actually fine tune models uh, in context in which formal verification provide information. So the, uh, the motivation here is, um, so let's say a car manufacturer pre-trained something based on existing knowledge. And now the, the car is deployed in a new city or in a new co country. The driving rules might be slightly different. That, is, that would be easier to deal with. But also uh, the culture, the people's perception of how driving should take place. Even the behavior at, I don't know, roundabouts in, vary from country to country, right? Whether we can actually refine such pre-trained models uh, after deployment, possibly, uh, incorporating additional knowledge that we can reason about through formal verification. So uh, human scores, when we will try to, refi we will try to remove that uh, human box from there, and we'll try to put a formal method. What can formal methods, how can formal methods provide feedback that might be used to train these models. Here's the workflow. <coughs> Again, some model, maybe some simulator, it will come later. Uh, I, I, I choose the word formal methods artifact relatively carefully. I'm not saying here formal verification feedback uh, because uh, uh, it is not necessarily a, a formal verification as in its uh, conventional sense. And there is a user, of, of course, interested in doing something. and. Um, uh, we might have a uh, prompt to a language model and it might give us a couple of responses and we will, I, in the next slide, I will relate these responses to actually these uh, automata-based objects that we extract from uh, as controllers and automated feedback and the automated feedback is going to rank these responses and it will be used to further train uh, the pre-trained model or fine-tune the pre-trained model. So what, the, what, how, what is the automated feedback? Uh, we thought if there are a couple of responses already generated, uh, then we can feed these things into, uh, uh, into a verification tool in this case. So this is, again, the view of the world that we have, two controllers we might have extracted, and, uh, and then a list of specifications. Let's, for, for sake of story, uh, let's say they are just a driver's handbook or some <coughs> rule book that we might have that we, we care about feed them into a uh, model checker, and then let's, again, this is, this is pretty uh, simplistic, but let's say response one satisfies all of the specifications we have in the list, and response two satisfies only a subset of them. We declare that the one that satisfies more is uh, more desirable, we rank it higher, and then use that, into, uh, use that uh, information into into fine tuning, and obviously whether these specifications are satisfied or not are coming from the model checker in this case or the for formal verification tool that you might have. And then using that procedure, here are a couple of graphs uh, that might help um, uh, with these claims. Training loss converges, it, it diminishes and after um, hundred iterations of this sort, actually, it, it becomes pretty sm small. Um, after a certain number of iterations, uh, if we continue to um, compare responses from this model, uh, then uh, it actually picks the one uh, which, which would have been preferred from the, uh, by the assessment based on the formal verification outcomes as well. 
uh, and, 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 and things are moving in the right direction, all right? And then if we, if we now look into, again, go through these uh, iterations and assess how many of the underlying specifications uh, are actually satisfied, early on, some of them are satisfied, but later on, what we see is that more of them are satisfied, and in addition to that, actually this variance in the number of specifications that are satisfied actually diminishes uh, quite well as well. Um, and the, the, this uh, discrepancy between, uh, it looks like the actual the validation uh, site satisfies more specifications is, it is just different sets of specifications are used for, uh, for, uh, for training and validation in this case. Then the next thing is, uh, what if we actually don't have these finite state objects as the world model uh, that we can use for formal verification? And, uh, and this is the part where formal verification artifacts comes into play. Still, we have the specifications, the requirements we might write as temporal logic so that we have a way to unambiguously actually uh, check whether the system behavior satisfies those specifications or not. And for, for the sake of... Uh, complicating things a little bit, we said, let's think that we don't have a simple model of the world, but we have a high fidelity simulator. We can go and still generate executions in this, in this simulator and check them against the uh, individual runs. We can check them against the requirements we have. And that empirical checking could also act as a, um, a, a source of ranking. And whether uh, the refinement is going to work in that case or not, and this, this, these figures are trying to argue that, uh, at least in this one case that we looked into, uh, similar trends are here. Um, uh, uh, the empirical source of feedback also, um, also helps in the way that it was, it was helpful uh, with uh, formal verification feedback. Okay, so that is it. So I, uh, this is a pictorial summary, um, but essentially the question is, or the, the, my position into all this thing is, these models are uh, so good that we cannot ignore them. And they also are so shady that we cannot blindly use them. And the connection between formal methods and, and, and these models could actually provide uh, quite a bit of utility. So that's it. Thank you.